Hello, my name is Melissa Golding and I'm the press officer for the Group of 30. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's live webinar launch of the G30's report, U.S. Treasury Markets, Steps Toward Increased Resilience, Status Update 2022. We will begin the webinar with opening remarks from the chair of the Group of 30 Working Group on Treasury Market Liquidity, Mr. Timothy Geithner. Mr. Geithner will be followed by project advisors, Jeremy Stein and Daryl Duffy and project director, Patrick Parkinson. Please note that everyone will be speaking today on behalf of the leadership team of the Group of 30's Working Group on Treasury Market Liquidity. They are here to discuss the report and to answer questions about the report from the webinar audience. They are participating in this webinar in their personal capacities and their participation does not imply the support of their respective public and private institutions. We will begin a roundtable Q&A discussion immediately following the formal remarks. I'd now like to introduce Timothy Geithner, chair of the G30 Working Group on Treasury Market Liquidity. Mr. Geithner. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks to all of you for joining us. About a year ago, the G30 issued a report with recommendations for how to make the U.S. Treasury market more resilient. We're releasing an, a short update today to that report. Pat Parkinson, Jeremy Stein, Daryl Huffy, and I led this effort with the valuable assistance of Stuart McIntosh and his team at the G30. We thought it would be valuable to revisit the case for those reforms, examine progress since, and identify the most promising areas for further improvement. A few summary points. First, we think the case for the G30 reforms is as strong today as it was then. The Treasury market is the most important financial market in the world. Treasuries are the foundational asset of the global financial system. This market needs a world-class regulatory framework and a strong and resilient infrastructure. The Treasury market has long since outgrown its infrastructure and regulatory framework. The capacity of the existing market makers has not grown with the size of the treasury market. Over the past year, there have been some meaningful steps forward and there are more in prospect. The principal US agencies are working together across a number of fronts. We are encouraged by the scope of the efforts underway, even though we don't yet know their full potential power. The most visible and concrete changes to date are the Fed's decisions to establish standing repo facilities for a class of market participants in the US and for central banks around the world. These are welcome steps, but they represent only part of the solution. There is less evidence of progress on the supplemental leverage ratio, which limits the capacity of the core of the US financial system to buy and finance treasuries in moments of stress. And there is less evidence of intent to make meaningful improvements on transparency. There are signs of movement on central clearing and on improvements to the safeguards around the clearing infrastructure. But the substance of potential reforms in these areas is still to be determined. The four areas that deserve the highest attention in our view are first, the realignment of bank leverage and risk-based capital requirements. Second, the creation of a roadmap for public dissemination of data on treasury market transactions. Third, broad central clearance of trades involving interdealer brokers and treasury repo. And fourth, the creation by the Federal Reserve of a broader standing repo facility. More on that in a minute. But I just wanna end by reinforcing the case for further actions. We are in a less certain and more dangerous world. U.S. and other central banks are going through a challenging transition in monetary policy. Reforms like those in the G30 report would add a margin of safety to these challenges. Investors who hold treasury securities should be able to finance them and turn them into cash with ease in normal conditions and in conditions of crisis. When they're not able to do so, or not confident in their ability to do so, the entire financial system is more fragile modest shocks are more dangerous, and the Fed is faced with a need for more dramatic policy measures with worse trade-offs. The reforms we laid out would make the foundation of the financial system more stable and better able to withstand the pressures we face today 
and that might come in the future. Even modest improvements toward these objectives can be extremely valuable given the importance of the treasury markets. We're encouraged by the changes underway and hope more actions are ahead. That's all for these intro remarks. Uh, Daryl, Jeremy, and Pat in that order are gonna summarize the priorities ahead and then we'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Yeah, let me speak to two of the, the, the issues that Tim flagged. First, uh, on realigning uh, leverage and risk-based capital requirements. Um, one of the core recommendations from our earlier report was, was, was around bank capital regulation and specifically the so-called leverage ratio, which imposes a uniform capital charge on anything that sits on a bank balance sheet, irrespective of its level of risk. And uh, as, as you all know, the leverage ratio was initially intended to serve as a backstop to the primary risk-based regime rather than the, uh, the dominant binding constraint. Um, but as it turns out, in part because the Fed expanded its reserves uh, dramatically, which in turn meant that the banking system had to absorb these reserves, thereby creating a bigger balance sheet for the, for the typical bank, the leverage ratio has turned out to be either the binding or the near binding constraint uh, for many of the largest bank holding companies. And as Tim alluded to, this creates a powerful uh, disincentive for two very basic uh, safe activities, one being making markets in you know, holding a, a, an inventory of treasury securities and the other being offering repo finance uh, against treasuries. In either case, the bank is required to to enlarge its balance sheet and, and further bump up against this leverage ratio. Um, and so, you know, our, 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 uh, our thinking was it would be a good idea to remove these, these essentially artificial constraints um, uh, to, to these safe activities. And that's the reason we recommended taking steps to make the leverage ratio less binding and more of a backstop per its original um, intent with the idea that the risk-based capital regime would then become again the binding or the more binding uh, standard shaping behavior. We didn't, um, to be clear, we didn't take a stand on exactly how this might be implemented. You can imagine alternative ways of, of getting to the same outcome. For example, you might exclude reserves from the denominator of a leverage ratio. Alternatively, you might leave the denominator the same, but change the quantitative requirement, i.e. lower it from 5% to a, to a lower uh, value. Uh, there are some subtle issues associated with which of these you choose, but from our perspective, either would have the desired effect of, of um, essentially making this less, uh, less of a deterrent to private sector market making and repo financing. So where does this stand? Um, in April of 2020, in the wake of the, the tensions in treasury markets at that time, um, the, the Fed basically made a temporary exemption and removed both reserves and treasuries on a temporary basis from the denominator of the so-called supplemental leverage ratio. Now, a year later in 2021, they let this relief, this temporary relief expire, but said they would be inviting comment on potential modifications to the supplementary leverage ratio. So far as we know, no such uh, request for comment has yet been issued, although we understand that the Fed staff is continuing to study the issue. Um, and again, uh, as Tim suggested, given sort of the concerns around the fragility of the, of the treasury market and the quite direct impact that we believe the leverage ratio has here, uh, we hope to see some progress on this front soon. And a final point here, sometimes the concern is expressed that, well, if you dial back the leverage ratio, that will amount to a weakening of bank capital requirements. And just want to emphasize that absolutely need not be the case. Whatever you do with the leverage ratio, it's always possible to make a compensating adjustment to the risk-based capital requirements such that the overall amount of capital in the banking system doesn't decline. And that's certainly uh, the view that we've, we've taken. Um, and we understand that the Fed plans to consider changes to the leverage ratio in the context of going about finalizing the, uh, the US implementation of Basel III, which may in fact result in a tightening of risk-based capital requirements. And it's understandable that you might wanna do the two of these together, but then of course that uh, from our perspective adds further urgency to finalizing these, um, these Basel requirements. Um, so that's, it on this. Okay, so here we go to the, the next topic I was going to 
touch on was the standing repo facility. As Tim mentioned, another one of our sort of core recommendations was that the Fed create a standing repo facility and importantly that it provide broad access to repo financing for treasuries. Now here there's been movement. In July of last year, the Fed created two repo facilities, a domestic one uh, known as the SRF for standing repo facility and one for international, foreign international monetary authorities goes by the acronym of FEMA. Um, and as we understand it, the Fed's primary objective here, and particularly with the SRF, was to support the implementation of monetary policy. You can think of this kind of heuristically as trying to smooth over the types of events we had in uh, September of 2019, when there were these spikes in the repo market. Um, perhaps with this monetary policy objective in mind, and perhaps also because of moral hazard concerns, the facility did not provide the sort of broad access that we had in mind in our um, earlier report, but rather limited the facility to dealers and to banks. So again, why, why did we focus, or why did we emphasize broad access? Again, our, our, our focus was not so much on monetary policy implementation, but rather on broadly strengthening the resilience of the treasury market so that it performs better in episodes like we saw in March of 2020. And we know that in this case, the research has shown that a lot of the selling pressure, a lot of the dash for cash came from mutual funds, hedge funds, and other non-bank, uh, non-dealer entities who felt a sudden uh, urgency to get cash. And our hope is basically, if these players know ahead of time that they will have sure access to repo financing as a way of monetizing their treasuries, they won't feel the need to preemptively sell. Conversely, if they don't have that assurance and things start to get hairy, they're gonna sell soon rather than waiting for conditions in the market to, to further deteriorate. Um, so that's the idea. And the, the concern we have with a narrow access facility is if you do it that way, you're relying as a policymaker and very importantly, you're hoping that the hedge funds and the mutual funds in this example will feel sure that they can somehow get when the Fed lends to a bank or to a dealer, that they can get that on lent to them from these private players. And especially in a stress situation, it doesn't seem obvious that you can count on them for two reasons. One, going back to what we we're just talking about, the SLR, the leverage ratio, constrains the ability and the willingness of these banks to on lend because that on lending blows up their balance sheet. Secondly, even if the leverage ratio were not a problem, their own internal risk management concerns, especially think of a very stressed situation, they may be wary of taking on additional counterparty exposure because of their own internal uh, risk management. So again, the concern we have with a narrow access facility is that essentially the Fed lends to the banks and the broker dealers, but the, 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 the liquidity gets stuck there, doesn't make its way, especially doesn't make its way with assurance to these other players, and they're then forced to, or they're induced to, uh, to sell preemptively. Um, now, what about the, the sort of moral hazard issues that, that sort of get talked about, and the idea that somehow this broader, such a broader facility might encourage, um, let's say, a hedge fund to lever its positions um, more aggressively? A few, a few counterpoints to consider here. Um, first, the facility is only meant for treasury securities. And we envision the Fed having a conservative haircut schedule, so the Fed would be in, in any kind of scenario well protected. Second, and again, this would be unique to treasuries, to the extent that a, a facility like that does in fact encourage some players to be more aggressive in their purchases and their levering of treasuries, um, um, this benefit, you know, what are they gonna do? They're gonna buy treasuries more aggressively, push up treasury prices, push down yields, that benefit, of course, accrues entirely to taxpayers. So it's very different than if you were doing repo, let's say, against corporate bonds, in which case the benefit might accrue to the corporate issuers, and you think in some sense this wasn't being properly um, internalized. Um, so as Tim said, the idea that treasury should be monetizable um, is something that just makes those treasuries more attractive and the benefit redounds uh, to the U.S. taxpayer. Third point, I think when you throw around the 
words moral hazard, it's important to recognize that it's a relative thing. And whatever moral hazard you imagine there might be with a repo facility, our concern is that if you don't have it, and again, you get this preemptive selling and the accompanying disorder we saw, then the Fed is essentially forced um, in some circumstances to step in and buy on an ad hoc basis. And again, whatever you think the moral hazard is with lending against treasuries, presumably it's higher if the Fed is stepping in and actually absorbing duration risk uh, in a stress scenario. And, and so important to think about relative moral hazard and the fact that you're never going to be able to commit the Fed not to intervening if things get um, sufficiently stressful. Final last point, the G30 report suggested that one way that the Fed could implement all of this and reach a broad range of counterparties would be to clear its repo lending uh, through the fixed income clearing corporation. Um, and if necessary, to further uh, address issues of moral hazard, the Fed could work with the SEC, which is the primary regulator of the, of the, of the FICC to strengthen uh, margin uh, requirements uh, to those that, to those players that access the the repo facility um, through the Fed, and so as Daryl will discuss next, robust uh, oversight of the fixed income clearing corporations risk management is another essential piece of our of our recommendations. So with that, let me I think now actually turn it over to uh, to Daryl. Thanks, Jeremy. <clears throat> Well, I want to talk about central clearing, but uh, before uh, people get concerned that this is something technical that, and, and, and mystical, let me try to simplify it. Uh, suppose I'm uh, a dealer and I, and I buy 70 million of some treasury note from one investor and I sell 100 million to another investor. I'm up for 170 million in total of commitments to settle that trade, whether it's a repo or a cash securities trade. That's if the trades are not cleared. But if there's a central counterparty that's clearing those trades, both of those commitments by me are to the central counterparty. So 100 million uh, against 70 million means I only have to deliver 30 million of treasuries. That's a huge reduction in commitments on my balance sheet. Uh, so a central uh, clearing party will actually lower the amount of commitments in the system. A study done by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Michael Fleming and Frank Keane, showed that on the peak days of March, April, 2020, had all trades been centrally cleared in the cash market, commitments to settle would have dropped by about 70% in the system. That's a major reduction in the commitments of dealer balance sheets and also in the amount of risk in the system. In addition to reducing risk and making more space on dealer balance sheets, when everyone knows that everyone is central clearing, everyone knows that the system is safe and there are uniform margin requirements. That means that unlevered positions are not gonna get out of control. They're always gonna be limited by the amount of margin demanded by the central counterparty. Moreover, central clearing, if it's in place, opens the door to all to all trade. And should that become favored by market participants, that can further lower the commitments of dealer balance sheets that Jeremy just explained are so important in making the treasury market functional on stress times. So what's been happening uh, in terms of movement, regulatory movement towards a greater degree of central clearing? Uh, where the market has been is about 13% of the market is centrally cleared uh, on both sides of each trade. That leaves a lot of space for increasing central clearing in the system and getting the benefits that I just described. Regulators have been looking at this just as the G30 report has suggested, segment by segment of the market. Let me take you through the progress and the recommendations that we've been making in this area. First, the lowest hanging fruit is the interdealer brokerage market. And as the name suggests, this is where dealers trade with each other. And dealer to dealer trades are already required to be centrally cleared. However, in that interdealer market in the last few decades, there's been an increasing amount of trade by non dealers. 
Most of these are called principal trading firms, and these are not required to be centrally cleared. To the point at which there is risk in this market that could be uh, reduced by central clearing. Uh, if all trades in the interdealer uh, brokered market were centrally cleared, then the interdealer broker itself would stop being an informal central counterparty that has no regulation as a central counterparty, and those trades would be more safely treated. The G30 report has recommended that that be done. Uh, regulators are discussing it. It comes up in remarks by Chair Gensler in November 2021 as a possible uh, movement in this area. The interagency working group last year uh, recommended that uh, central clearing in all segments of the market be studied. The next lowest hanging fruit and also uh, recommended for central clearing in the G30 report is the treasury repurchase market. There is already a significant amount of central clearing in that market. And uh, the recommendation here is that the entire repo market be centrally cleared, again, to gain the benefits that I described earlier. And then the third segment of the market is the customer to dealer market for cash securities trades. This is a very large market that's not centrally cleared. Essentially, very few of those trades, if any, are centrally cleared. Here, however, the costs and benefits are still less clear. Uh, so the G30 report does not make a recommendation uh, yet on any uh, central clearing in this particular market, and regulators are looking at it. The Finally, the G30 report has recommended that uh, the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation, which is the central counterparty uh, for the Treasury market, should uh, be subjected to a design and uh, review process of its operation, uh, review of its design and operations by its regulator, the Securities and Exchange Commission, to ensure that the FICC is well regulated, uh, liquid, stable, and has access to. Uh, fair access to central clearing by all relevant uh, market participants. So I think that summarizes uh, the situation with respect to central clearing. There's movement among regulators to study the issue. Uh, we believe there's a likelihood that uh, some recommendations will be forthcoming soon, uh, but there's no actual change in the regulatory status in this area yet. Thank you. And pass it over to Pat now. All right, I'm going to discuss the last of the priorities that we identify in the status update, and that's uh, re regard to the public dissemination of transaction level data on Treasury transactions. Uh, as recommended by the G30, U.S. regulators are on a path to achieving essentially complete coverage of transactions in U.S. Treasury securities in something called the trace reporting system that's operated by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, or FINRA. Um, the self-regulatory arm of the securities industry. Furthermore, FINRA has been taking steps to improve the quality of data on transactions and treasury securities. These data are shared with the SEC, Federal Reserve, Treasury, and CFTC. But while certain weekly data are made public, no transactions level trace data for treasury securities, not even historical data uh, dating back to 2017 have been publicly disseminated. Um, the G30 report, just a second. G30 report, report concluded that public dissemination of transactions data would have important public benefits. In particular, it would facilitate evaluation of alternative methods of trade execution and encourage greater use of electronic trading platforms that facilitate competitive execution among existing dealers and enable additional market participants to supply liquidity on those platforms. It would also facilitate counterparty risk management, including by the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation, by increasing the accuracy of prices used to measure counterparty exposures and to determine the appropriate size of market margin calls. The G30 report acknowledged the legitimacy of concerns that immediate public disclosure of certain trades, such as large trades and off-the-run issues, could reduce market liquidity. 
Market makers could become reluctant to intermediate such trades for fear that other market participants would exploit the disclosures to profit at the market maker's expense. However, the G30 report concluded that those concerns could be addressed effectively by capping the disclosed size of trades and relatively illiquid issues in a manner similar to the way that the trace data on corporate bond transactions currently are publicly disclosed. We believe that the case for public dissemination of transactions level trace data for treasuries remains compelling. Indeed, the case has been strengthened by a re recent review by Harvard's program on international financial systems. That review surveyed empirical academic research on the effects of post-trade transparency on the liquidity of the corporate bond markets and many other financial markets. The review concluded that post-trade transparency has consistently increased liquidity, reduced transactions cost, and enhanced price efficiency in those markets. Consequently, we recommend that the SEC in consultation with the Treasury and drawing on the results of the public consultation the Treasury recently initiated should provide a roadmap for using the trace data to achieve at least as much public transparency for the Treasury markets as is currently provided for the corporate bond markets. The lingering concerns about adverse effects can best be addressed by initially capping disseminated trade sizes for trades of relatively illiquid issues. And if no adverse effects are observed, gradually raising the caps. So thank you. That concludes our presentation on, on the report. Thanks. Thanks to each of you. Melissa, you're going to guide us through some questions. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Geithner. Our first question comes from Liz McCormick at Bloomberg News. The Fed's QT is just getting started, and we've already had dealers say bouts of illiquidity have become more common. How big an impact does the panel feel the Fed's QT will likely have in terms of adding to stress on the Treasury's market? And how concerned are you that liquidity will be badly affected, especially for the off the runs? It may disappoint you to hear this, but I think that we want to stay away from any observations or comments on the monetary policy transitions that the Fed is under, underway today. I mean, Jeremy, you, you, if you want to address it, you're welcome to, to address it, but I think it's slightly outside the scope of uh, what we're trying to do here. Other than to say, other than to say that anything that increases the size of the bond market in the hands of the public sort of exacerbates, you know, the, 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 this general tendency that we've seen as the public debt has grown and the market making capacity of the dealer community has not kept pace, those are exacerbated any time or the, the potential concerns uh, become worse just as the scale uh, goes up. So that's nothing special about QT, but it's just about growth of growth of, of, of treasury. Thank you. Our next question comes from Sharon Therovellum from risk.net. Regarding the recommendation that prudential regulators ensure risk and sensitive leverage ratios function as backstops to risk-based capital requirements, does the G30 have a view on how best this would be accomplished, for example, either excluding reserves and treasury securities from the SLR or excluding reserves alone? I mean, Jeremy can elaborate on this, but he said in his remarks that uh, he reminded everybody we didn't really take a view on the relative merits of the ways to address this problem. Uh, I think we believe they can be confident that they can address this problem without the risk that they're lowering the overall level of capital in the system against risk. Uh, but we didn't take a view on the various ways you can approach this. There's lots of ways to do it. It's, it's not rocket science and the returns on doing it, we think will be pretty high. Thank you. Our next question comes from Daniel Hinge of Central Banking. Can you comment on efforts to improve non-bank regulation globally? Presumably a more resilient non-bank financial sector would also boost treasury market stability, but it feels like progress has been slow. Well, 
very good, also a very good question, uh, like the others, but somewhat outside the scope of our our report. I'd, I think I'd say what Jeremy said in response to the first question, which is that the changes in the structure of the financial system, including what you refer to, are 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 changes that reinforce the case for these these uh, suggestions for how to improve the basic resilience of the treasury yeah. market. And and if and if um, we're going to be living with the reality of uncertain gradual progress on those dimensions of it, the case for these changes is, is even higher. Daryl, you were going to add something. Yeah, I was just going to say there is one uh, aspect of this that is in scope, which is bringing a wider set of market participants into central clearing. Uh, that That is a way to provide some uh, controls on leverage taking outside of the regulated banking system and also improve safety and soundness in the, in the treasury securities market. Thank you. Our next question is from Francisco Covas at the Bank Policy Institute. The focus on SLR reform is important, but many of the large banks are bound by risk-based requirements due to the GSIB surcharge which also has many features of leverage ratios, not risk weighted. Does the report also make recommendations to update the GSIB score for economic growth and reduce cliff effects? The risk of disappointing you, I'll just repeat again, we're not gonna, we don't offer an opinion on the broader set of questions of what precise adjustments the capital regime would be would be best. Uh, so I'll just say again that we're confident you could improve this aspect of the capital regime without undermining the amount of capital in the system that's held against risk. Thank you. Our next question is from Kate DeGuid at the Financial Times. Overnight RRP usage is still hitting record figures. Is that a sign to you that something in the market isn't functioning? Jeremy? Yeah, I can take a crack at this. Um, let, let, let's, let's first be very clear on sort of all the jargon. So it, it gets confusing. There's, we've been talking about a standing repo facility, which would be an asset to the Fed, which would be the Fed essentially lending um, to, against treasury securities. The RRP, the overnight uh, reverse repurchase facility, is a liability to the Fed. It's effectively the Fed borrowing from the money fund sector against the Fed's holdings of, of securities. And so that, um, as you point out, has grown very rapidly. So in the last year, I think right now, the volume of this uh, overnight uh, RRP is on the order of 2 trillion from essentially zero a year ago. Now there's a very straightforward explanation for this. And I don't think this, this particularly is about market stress, the Fed controls two interest rates in, in its monetary policy. It sets the interest rate on reserves and it sets a lower interest rate that it, it pays to investors in this, in this overnight RRP. The, the, the gap between those had been, I think, 15 basis points and the Fed cut it to 10 by raising the relative uh, payment it makes on this RRP, thereby just making it more attractive to money funds and others. And it did this um, again, before rates started to go up. So it was, it was essentially a way of improving monetary control, of tightening up the floor on interest rates. And it's, it succeeded in that. And that drew, it drew essentially money out of reserves and into this RRP program. But I think that was an intended effect of what you might think of as a monetary policy kind of technical implementation maneuver. I don't think, I think maybe you, you might've had in mind that if the standing repo facility was seeing a lot of action that might have indicated some stress, but that's, that's not what's going on um, in this case. Thank you. Another question from Daniel Hinge at Central Banking. At last year's briefing, it was said it would be better to act while the memory of the 2020 crisis is still fresh. Is that memory already fading? I don't think so. And uh, again, although we don't yet know the full scope of what the US uh, agencies are going to do, 
uh, I do think there's more focus and effort and more attention to this across a broader range of things than has been true for quite a long time. And I think that's a measure of the severity of the challenges that we face in that context. And of course, the examples that preceded it. Uh, so I don't think the memory's faded yet, uh, but I think time, you know, these things are, some of these things you can do quickly with pretty quick immediate impact. Some will take some time to have some effect, and that's a good reason to, to move on them because, uh, because, uh, you know, the benefits, the benefits will come sooner, the quicker they get there. Uh, so I think that they're, they're making some progress can't see it yet. Uh, it's encouraging to see this amount of focus and attention. It does require a bunch of agencies working together on a common problem and trying to think about how to use their authorities in creative ways. And I think we can be hopeful uh, that we're going to see some some more powerful movement. Uh, but we'll have to see how things unfold. Thank you. Our next question is from Christopher Spink at IFR. Would changing the leverage ratio require overall overhaul of the Basel rules? If that takes time, would you be happy to see the temporary measures of 2020-2021 kept in reserve for use in times of market stress as seen in March 2020 as a next best solution? Jeremy, you want to do that? Yeah. I don't think I don't think um, that any modifications that would be made to the leverage ratio require um, international uh, cooperation and negotiation. I mean, one thing to know, for example, about the supplementary leverage ratio, it was effectively a choice of U.S. regulators to gold plate relative to the international uh, standard, which is lower. So the U.S. is operating essentially above the international standard and. That was a choice made by U.S. regulators, and a decision to move in a different direction would presumably be a choice of U.S. regulators. And a follow-up question. Wider clearing of treasuries and treasury repos would further concentrate risks in the central counterparty, FICC. Some market participants express concerns about the FICC's risk management. Are you confident that the FICC is up to the job? What is the basis for your confidence? Uh, well, first, the premise of the question is correct. It does concentrate more risk in relative terms at the FICC. But in the remarks I gave earlier, I noted that the more you clear, the less the total amount of risk. Now, I gave an example in which there were 170 million of commitments before central clearing and only 30 million of commitments after central clearing. So while the concentration at the CCP, the central counterparty, goes up, the total amount of risk is going down. And now to the question. Uh, the, there is a lot of expertise at the FICC. We had the opportunity in our G30 report to speak to them. Uh, whether going forward, the FICC is uh, optimized with respect to regulation and its design and operation. Well, we did recommend also that that issue be studied and that the regulators uh, focus on the safety, uh, liquidity, and soundness of the fixed income clearing corporation. Uh, that, uh, that issue was not uh, dissuading us from making the recommendations that we made. We made them in light of uh, the current state of the FICC and potential improvements going forward. We have another question. Many large market participants seem to fear that public dissemination of trade data will decrease treasury market liquidity. They dismiss empirical evidence from other markets on the grounds that the treasury markets are different, especially with respect to the prevalence of very large trades. How confident are you that the research on other markets can be extrapolated to confidently assess the effects of public transparency on the treasury markets? 
Uh, I'll take that one. I don't think you can have complete confidence. Uh, it's encouraging uh, the, the assessment of the effects in those other markets, but I think it would be understandable if regulators proceed cautiously. But I think the important thing is to proceed. Uh, and one way you could proceed cautiously, as we recommended, is initially for the LAR, for, for illiquid issues to cap the reported size of trades. And we think that's an effective mitigant of the potential risks that have been identified. And then you could assess uh, what the effects of the caps were. And if you weren't seeing any adverse effects, you could raise them. Basically, that's the same approach that was taken to the corporate bond markets by the SEC and the, and the submarket self-regulator many years ago, where they only gradually phased in uh, uh, the public dissemination of, of data, studied the effects, and when they gained confidence that it was having positive effects, uh, broadened uh, the scope of the disclosures. Thank you. Access to the Fed's SRF is far narrower than proposed by the G30. Is it broad enough to be effective or does it rely too heavily on intermediation by banks and bank affiliated dealers, especially given the fact that the SLR continues to discourage intermediation by nearly all the firms with access to the SRF? I appreciate that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question and essentially a restatement of some of the points that, that we wanted to make. Um, I think the current setup of the SRF is probably adequate for the goal they had in mind, which was essentially monetary policy implementation. But again, for a broader, to create broader resilience in the treasury market, we think that an important um, you know, piece of that is deterring preemptive runs or preemptive sales by folks who need cash and aren't assured that they're gonna be able to monetize their treasuries by by repo borrowing against them. And for the reasons that the, the, the questioner uh, noted, both, both the SR, um, the, the leverage ratio, and again, the internal risk management controls uh, of, the, of the banks and the dealers imply that in a stress scenario, borrowing that they do from the Fed may very well not get on lent to these other market participants. That's why we want these other market, market participants to be able to face the Fed to know ahead of time that they can face the Fed directly before they go uh, starting to sell uh, as an alternative. That's exactly, and I think the question just uh, you know, more or less framed our motivation uh, exactly. Well, also, I mean, Jeremy, at this point, and, and you mix it very well, which is, you know, it's important to recognize, you know, this is, a, this is about lending against treasuries. And, uh, and the Fed has lots of ways to, think about the amount of risk it takes in that context. And it can use margin and haircuts as a way to help mitigate that risk. And you can use that to help to help uh, manage the broader concerns people have with incentives uh, with kind of broader, broader access. Thank you. We have another question. Broader central clearing of repos would effectively increase margin requirements on repo financing? Isn't there a risk that higher margins would decrease the demand for treasuries by leveraged investors and make it more expensive for them to provide market liquidity under stress? Gerald, do you want to do that? Sure. Uh, well, the question, the premise again is correct. Uh, it would reduce demand, especially by those market participants that want to take unbounded leverage. And so there is a trade-off. Uh, the proposal was made to include repo in central clearing so as to put a floor on leverage in that market. And the demand that would be reduced would be the demand that would be most risky in terms of the you know, uh, unlimited leverage offered in current bilateral repo trades. So yes. Uh, the, the idea is that you make the market safer and you sacrifice the uh, demand by those who uh, are taking the riskiest positions in the market. Just, just worth noting, by the way, that this point is in some sense a useful um, answer to the previous concern that was raised about won't, or won't the uh, standing repo facility create moral hazard. 
this would in some sense be a mitigant, you know, moral hazard because guys are going to leverage too aggressively up front. This would be one of the uh, one of the potential mitigants uh, to that. Sorry, you said you said floor on leverage. Did you mean ceiling on leverage? Sorry, yes, the ceiling. Thank you. We have another question from Daniel Hinge at Central Banking. Do you have a sense that the Fed would be willing to consider broadening the SRF? Are you aware of any discussions underway on that front? I mean, obviously the Fed's considered it, uh, and I don't have any sense, any feel for the for their um, willingness in the near term to go broader. Although we would encourage them to do so. Thank you. We have a question from John Sinison. What concerns do you have regarding the de-dollarization? And can the Fed handle a potential US Treasury exodus? Jeremy, do you want to? do that I would say it's <laughs> no no I mean just other than you know uh, as Tim said I think at the outset um, the fact that the treasury market is sort of the central <laughs> fundamental market in, in in the financial world obviously related to the status of the dollar uh, adds some urgency to sort of the general thrust of what we're what we're about but, but beyond that I don't know that I'd say so much else. I, I would like to add to that, I agree with Jeremy, uh, that the safer and sounder uh, the U.S. Treasury market is, the more it supports the use of the dollar in international finance. Uh, and that's good for the United States and it's good for global investors. And it, because of that demand, uh, it lowers the taxpayer's bill uh, to meet U.S. fiscal deficits. Thank you. We have another question from Liz McCormick at Bloomberg News. Your top priority recommendation is to realign banks leverage and risk-based capital requirements with the SLR now particularly a binding regulatory constraint on capital allocation and is limiting intermediation. You noted that this change has been slow to come given regulators feel that any loosening of leverage restrictions would weaken the resilience of these banks and of the banking system as a whole. Can you speak more on while you feel this is not true and if you are hopeful that the Fed will ultimately make the changes to leverage ratios as you all recommend that they do? Thank you, make a crack. Um, it's certainly true. Uh, I think it's almost tautologically true that if the leverage ratio is the binding constraint for a particular bank, let's say, and all you do is relax the leverage ratio, you are allowing that bank to get by with fewer dollars of capital. And of course, we think that essentially dollars of capital uh, or dollars of capital relative to assets is what, is what determines the resilience of the banking sector. But of course, you're not limited to only just moving around the leverage ratio. And I think that was our point. I think we all believe strongly that we wouldn't want this recommendation to, res to result in fewer dollars of capital, less resilience in the banking system. And the natural thing to do is to make a compensating adjustment to the risk-based capital requirement so that at the end of the day, dollars of capital in the system don't go down. Um, you know, as Tim said, I mean, there are details to this, but it's a pretty straightforward exercise. Okay, so the idea is you have, you have two tools. You have whatever adjustments you make to the leverage ratio and whatever adjustments you make to the risk-based standard. And it's just an easy enough proposition to make an offsetting adjustment so to target, so it's essentially target that you're not allowing capital in the, in the banking system to decline. Do you think, Melissa, we've done justice to the substance of this now? Um, I. I think so. There was just one overall broad uh, question that we were asked. Um, the status update report identifies a subset of the original recommendations as priorities. Can it be inferred that the other recommendations are no longer important? Uh, 
Pat, do you want to do that? Sure. No, I think that that would not be our intention. Uh, again, uh, we I think we recognize uh, that the urgency of doing some of these things is greater. Uh, that the bandwidth of the agencies, given all the other things going on in the world, is is uh, is not unlimited. So we essentially set a set of priorities, but that doesn't mean we don't we've abandoned our our support for the other things in the report. It's just that we think these ones, given limited resources, uh, are the ones they should be focused on now. And I think almost all there are a couple of exceptions, but almost all the recommendations seem to be given some degree of consideration in the agencies to judge from the interagency report that was released last November. Um, but, but I think these are, again, the ones that we think are most promising, most urgent, and with limited resources, we think they should focus on. Uh, very grateful to all of you for joining us, and thanks for giving these issues some thoughtful consideration. And I want to just, again, express appreciation to Stuart uh, and Melissa and their colleagues at the, at the G30 for all the help on this. And, to say what it's been a, what a pleasure it's been to work again with Daryl Duffy and Jeremy and, and Pat Parkinson. Uh, they're the most thoughtful among the most knowledgeable people in the world in these questions. We're very lucky they were going to be part of this G30 effort. So thank you very much.